Welcome everyone. We are so happy that you're here with us today. My name is Rachel Sarah Thurston. I'm the owner of State of Sparkle. I work as a marketing and branding coach and consultant for authors, writers, business owners, and, and artists. I met Connard originally through Dale Griffith Stamos, and she's with us today as well. Dale worked as the editor for his book. And I'm just very grateful to you, Dale, because working with Connard has been a complete delight. I've been working with Connard the last year, helping him with his website, um, guiding him through social media, upping his social media game, helping with the newsletters, and then um, some aspects of marketing his new memoir. But along the way, Conard's become a very dear friend. And Conard, it has been a total delight working with you. For those of you that know, <laughs> for those of you that know Conard, he's very bright. He's very driven. He has a very keen sense of humor. And he also has a very kind heart and a curious mind about the world. I'd also like to welcome today his wife, Janet, who's tuning in from the other corner of the house. Hey, Janet. <laughs> <laughs> Way down there. Um, at some point, we may have Stephanie Chandler, who is the director of the Nonfiction Writers Conference, and she is also the owner of Authority Publishing, the hybrid publisher that Connor used to publish Once Upon a Kentucky Farm. Uh, we have Dale Griffith Stamos, who worked as the editor of his, his book, and I think did a fabulous job. And then, of course, I want to welcome the rest of you. Um, my mom and John are in our reading critique group with Conard. They're tuning in from different parts of the country. I'm in Santa Barbara right now with Conard. And then the rest of the family, the friends and family of Conard's, I feel like I know a little bit about you all um, from his book. And it's really exciting to meet many of you who are like many celebrities now <laughs> um, through your connection and relationship with Conard. And let, let me break in, Rachel. I hate to sound morbid, but with this collection of people, family and friends from all over the place, I'm starting to feel like this is my wake. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse my morbid sense of humor. <laughs> I, ho I hope that you don't feel like that. You're, you're, you've got a friendly audience, right? You all give them some love in the chat and uh, write something sweet in the chat if you can. <laughs> so um, let's see. So I want to just go over what we're going to do. I'm going to do an introduction on Conard, and we are going to go into an interview on the process of Conard writing this memoir. And then afterwards, we're going to have a Q&A. And we've got a really fun gift giveaway where Connor's going to be doing a random drawing of everyone that registered and is in attendance today. And so one of you will have the opportunity to win a free copy of his book. I want to also say that his book recently came out on Amazon and you can actually buy it as a paperback or a Kindle version ebook right now on Amazon. And I'll be I'm, I'm, excuse me, I'm entering the, I thought I had turned off the waiting room, but we are getting some people coming in on the waiting room. Welcome to those of you that are just joining us. And if you can make sure to mute yourself and please write in the chat how you know Connard and where you're tuning in from. I, we've just started a little bit of an introduction about who I am. I just saw a friend from the Santa Barbara Writers Conference, welcome. And my mom already has her book. So she's already role modeling. I'll be sharing, <laughs> I'll be sharing how to, to order the book. Actually, let me put that in the chat right now before we go any further. And I will be sharing that again in a minute uh, at the very end. Okay. So here's a little short introduction on Connard. And I'm going to, so I'm not rustling papers. I'm switching around some of my notes here. If you can excuse me. So Conard Hogan, he grew up in the suburbs of Louisville, Kentucky, and he spent many weekends and holidays with his grandparents on their farm in rural Kentucky, and that would be the Riggs family. <laughs> he grew up in a dysfunctional household with a father who was an alcoholic and a rageaholic. 
his mother and he and his brother all suffered abuse from his father's behaviors. Connor sought respite from his father's abuse by visiting his grandparents on the weekends and holidays on, his, on their subsistence farm where they grew tobacco, vegetables, and they raised pigs and chickens. Throughout Connor's childhood, his brother and parents moved at least a dozen times, which took quite a toll on, on all three of them. Once Connor turned 19, he was drafted into the US Army and he served a one year tour in the Vietnam War. After an honorable mis military discharge, he earned his BA in sociology and an MA in marriage, family and child counseling. Over his 25 years as a therapist, Conard has specialized in treating alcoholics and addicts and those suffering from major psychiatric disorders like PTSD. Now, as many of you know, Conard is a true Renaissance guy. He is an avid hiker, he's a world traveler. He and his wife, Janet, have traveled all around the world, including to Iceland, Mongolia, and Antarctica, which I'm personally very jealous of. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I lost my, uh, it's funny, I'm toggling between these screens here. Uh, Conard has also, this was very interesting. I didn't know this about him until I was working with him on his website. Conard has accomplished a very unique record of being the 254th person to climb the highest points of every state in the US, including Mount McKinley, which is a very formidable mountain in Alaska. He's also been the fourth person to visit the lowest points of all 50 states and the first person in world history to end all 50 states in Kentucky as a tribute to his, his um, birth state. He's currently hiking the Pacific Crest Trail in sections, starting from the Mexican border and going north from there. So I'm gonna be asking questions of Conard about his process writing this memoir, and I'm gonna do my best. I know, I don't think most of you, have any of you read the book yet? I'm assuming my mom has read part of it. Okay. I'm seeing hands. Anyone that has read all I have. Oh, Dale has, of course. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Dale has. Intimately, Sorry, you know we're it. going a little crazy here. I'm back. <laughs> so Dale and my mom. So what I've, I've fashioned these questions to ask him about his process and some parts of the book, but we're going to do our best to not spoil anything major in the book. So it's all still a surprise to you all. If you grew up with Conard and you have extra comments to share, please feel free if we're talking about something that triggers these memories for you, please feel free to chime in in the chat and share some stories or just um, responses. And I'm gonna make sure to try to save the chat at the end so Conard can look over all of the comments. And also when I'm done interviewing him, we are gonna have the Q&A for you all to, to chime in hopefully and get to all of your questions. So I am so inspired by how far this book has come. Uh, Once Upon Kentucky Farm, excuse my background. It's kind of, Connor, can you hold up your copy so they can see how sure. beautiful it is? Awesome, thank you. It's an absolutely gorgeous book. I, it was such a fast read. Sometimes when you're reading a memoir, you think, oh my gosh, this might be laborious, but this book was a breeze to read. And as soon as I finished it, I told my husband, I cannot wait to read his next book. He has three memoirs planned right now, which he'll be talking about later. The way I think of Once Upon a Kentucky Farm uh, is it's very much part coming of age, part trauma memoir and a part love letter to farm living in the rural South and the joys and pains of family. It's a truly moving memoir and many of the farm scenes, what they ate, how they farmed, reminded me personally of growing up in the rural Midwest, just two hours North actually, Connor, to where you grew up. We grew up two hours apart from each other. It was very reminiscent to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to start, would you like to welcome anyone um, that came on a little bit later before? Well, I I'd like. Question? just like to say welcome everyone i'm glad you're here i'm honored and thrilled that you are here to listen to me blather a while <laughs> and i think we'll all agree connor does not blather he's very discerning with everything that he says and i'm just so we're thrilled that you're all here 
with us because this is in a very big way, a celebration of eight years of work and a lifetime of experiences distilled into this book. And Connor, I'm really blown away by the level of penmanship and storytelling in this book. Thank so you. my first question is, what inspired you to write this first memoir? Actually, it wasn't the first memoir I wrote. Um, I wrote my Vietnam memoir first. And I think I was too intimidated to push beyond that to look seriously into publication. Um, and I think as a result, then I've turned to some other things I could write about. And I'm not a structured type writer. I don't have the plot in advance. And so I began to write some of the memories that I had about farm. And then, of course, then it dawned I could conceivably write a book about it, uh, which would include my experiences at home. So um, gradually moving into beginning to write some of the scenes that are in the book. And then later on, I began to add more and more and then turn it into more of a coming of age memoir. Although I don't, I'm not, I don't believe I'm that good at characterizing what this is, what it is. It is coming of age. It is about trauma. It is, it's about a lot of things, but I'll leave it to other people to make that decision for themselves. How many years did it take you to write this book? For those of you that aren't writers, it's an extraordinary undertaking to write a memoir. Well, for me, <laughs> well, I think that's true for everyone, but for me, it definitely is an extraordinary undertaking. The first um, manuscript that I have dated uh, in my computer is from 2014. So I would think probably I started writing a year or two prior to that. So I'd say 10 years. And how fair, many fair estimate? How many drafts did you go through? How many times did you rewrite? That's a difficult, uh, that's a fair question. Um, it's difficult to answer because my style is I'll write a chapter, I'll write a scene, write something else and toggle back and forth and rewrite and re-edit and learn something and come back and re-edit and rewrite. Um, it's a constant effort until, um, as Leonardo da Vinci said, I think um, art is not completed, it's abandoned. I'm paraphrasing. Right. Um, so um, I'd say at least a couple of times and one was the last major edit with uh, Dale's um, assistance and direction as an editor. And, and once that had been completed, that was basically the finish. I really like in the book how, as you all embark on reading this, it's very much a story of love and darkness, love and pain, joy and pain. And the way that um, Dale helped him restructure contrasting those two. It's a lovely balance between the joyful memories that you had on your grandparents' farm and then the darkness and the pain that you and your family were enduring in the shadow of your father's alcoholism. And I was wondering if you could read a passage, um, just a, a, a short passage. It was the one on page 41. Sure. Um, the context for this passage is this book takes place from when Connard's around four years old to around the 18 years old. So it's really the coming of age years for him. Mm -hmm. And he's a young boy in this scene. And he sees this calendar with a, another young boy about your age. Is that right? With the fishing pole? About. And he just seems to have an idyllic life that Connard wishes that he could have. And it's... So uh, let me preface before I read, uh, excuse me if I get verklempt, uh, periodically, and it surprises me at times that I am, the emotions of what I've written come up for me as I read this. And I know it's my story and I've experienced this with certain scenes before, but I'm never sure in advance if that's gonna happen again. But I wrote this manuscript deliberately and with Dale's encouragement as well to specifically and deliberately focus on the intensity of my emotions in order to write that to connect with the reader in hopes that if I was to have as the writer 
that experience when I read it, then certainly a reader had a greater chance to experience it. And that's what makes reading, I think, um, such a wonderful experience for people. So that said, <clears throat> the barefoot boy in coveralls and a straw hat lay against a log next to a fishing pole at the edge of a pond. About my age, about my size and age, the straw in his mouth and his hands in his pockets suggested he had no worries. His country life better than my city life? I lived in a neighborhood with barking dogs, where a rock thrown with my eyes closed would likely hit a house or a car. I lived where a fishing pole would catch questions but not fish, and where a gun in the open could lead to a police visit. Did he ever worry about his dad beating his mom? Hard to imagine so. Wished my life could be that peaceful. I especially love the line where, where fishing poles can catch questions. There were so many lines that I just wanted to underline when I was reading this, just very poetic and thoughtful and moving. Mm. There was a Brene Brown quote that you brought up to me recently that you had wanted to share that has to do with the process. Yes, uh, I just, I came across, uh, when I was developing my website, I decided I wanted to try to put quotes in, in the web pages. And I came across a number of them that I really liked that really touched me. Here's one that's on one of my uh, web uh, pages that I particularly like from Brene Brown. <clears throat> One day you will tell your story of how you overcame what you went through. And here's where I get for Clint. And it will be someone else's survival guide. I can feel that in reading this. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine the process for you in reliving some of these memories. And, I, and I, I do hope that it does inspire others to share their stories from their childhoods and trauma that they've had in their lives. Yeah, let me, let me preface, probably as a therapist, I would say this, I would hope it would be true regardless, that when it brings up those feelings for me, uh, I think I think that more of as a healing process, not a traumatic process. And I think truth about pain is healing. And I think touching the pain is healing. And I think it's necessary to heal. So I've, I've come to accept that's okay. It has to be. I love that. And we will be talking more um, about trauma for, further on. I was so impressed by the details that you had. Um, when you all read this book, it's going to make you hungry for watermelon and biscuits and gravy and fresh blackberries <laughs> and blackberry cobbler and fried chicken. It reminded me a lot of the comfort food I grew up with in the Midwest. And um, just briefly, I'm very curious from a writer to a writer, how you remembered all of that, what type of research you did to make sure you had the details and the dialogue and the memories of your loved ones so intact? Um, it's not as if I felt it was difficult or needed a lot of research. What I did need was a lot of sitting with myself and writing the words and looking at the words. And then sometimes, as I said earlier, leaving it and coming back to it and attempting to re-immerse myself in that scene and just feel the, the, the essence of the scene. And in a sense, I was recreating my memory when I did that. And I think that's what memory and I think that's what memory is. You're recreating the experience within your mind as best that you remember. I've noticed too that we have superpowers as writers because, oh, Stephanie's joining us. Stephanie is the, his publisher. I'm going to welcome her as soon as her audio is on. Welcome, <laughs> Stephanie. Can you can you turn your video on and wave to everybody? Hi, <laughs> I'm in, in my car. car. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to make sure and come by. Congratulations, Connor. Oh, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Great Stephanie. You. So Stephanie is the 
owner and director of the Nonfiction Writers Conference, the Nonfiction Authors Association, and she is the founder, director, and owner of Authority Publishing. She's phenomenally talented. I'm a huge (laughs) fan, and I was so excited Connor chose to publish with Stephanie. So Stephanie, we're stoked to have you on board. We did a shout out for you earlier, and we hope you can be on for as long as possible. Thank you. I'm going to stay as long as I can. My, I'm sitting here waiting for my son. I'll turn off my video, but thank you for the kind words. I love your background. It's gorgeous. Oh, thank you. It's all natural, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. So, Good to um, have you. <laughs> there was something that I was going to say about the details. Is I think as writers, we have superpowers to almost recreate memories as well. And when we write about let's just talk about joyful memories. When we write about them, we immortalize them and it galvanizes the memories in our brains, our neural pathways, and it only strengthens them. I found that that's a really lovely superpower that we have. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you about writing about trauma and abuse. For memoir writers dealing with abuse, trauma, dark family histories, it can be quite precarious for us to take on writing a book about actual people in our lives who may still be alive, that secrets will be revealed publicly, not just mm-hmm. to our family, but to the whole wide world. Was it initially difficult to share these stories about your family and your parents' marriage? And were you worried about how this book might impact family members still living? Um. Yeah, that's, let me, that's kind of a two part. Um, I don't know that without having been a marriage and family therapist for 25 years and processing my own emotional reactions to people, looking at my own history and assess, reassessing that and dealing with other people as their emotions came up and helping guide them through that, that I would have been able to write this. I don't know, but that's my suspicion. In other words, having had that experience, it helped me get to the position where I was more prepared to write this. And so as I wrote about the the more negative aspects of it, um, I did not feel traumatized by it. I felt, I, I took it more from a perspective of just being honest and being truthful as to what I understood had occurred in the past in my experience, not only for me, but my mother, my father, my brother, and all my other family members as I wrote about them in my interaction with them. <clears throat> Getting a little lost here. <laughs> um, it was, um, were you help. concerned about being naked in front of the world with your own to, pain? Yes. And, you know, revealing your, your, your father's dark side to, to the world. To some degree, yes. Um, um, though when I began writing it, many of the family had passed away. My father, uh, I think I had started writing it while he was still living. Uh, but more recently, my father has passed away. My mother's passed away. All of my aunts on my father's side, except for one um, aunt-in-law. She's actually the uh, wife of Uncle James, Brenda. Um, and one on my father's side, Aunt Linda. Um, so it, it, and most of everyone in the, in, in the book, I think would not have been upset about what I wrote, except about my father, um, regarding the alcoholism and the rage Rageaholism. <laughs> yeah. um, though at the time it was no big secret. It's just that the general w- rule was that's not something we talk about in public. We don't air our dirty laundry. Uh, but it was no secret. And, and even during his eulogy, I gave my father's eulogy, just it had to be a short one, but I, I talked about the issue of the drinking uh, mm-hmm. as a way to. I wanted to be truthful as a way to honor myself, my brother, my mother, but also to honor him. He was a victim of alcoholism just as much as we were, I think, in the the end. 
So I, I did have, I do have some uh, concern about reactions of a few cousins I, who I've lost contact with. I won't get into specifics, um, but as I said, I think in the preface or yeah, a forward, um, I didn't intend to upset them. That was, that, that was not my intent. And I'm certainly willing to talk with them if they ever come to me with some issue or want to talk about anything for that matter. So uh, um, that was about my only concern was. I wanted possible. to add yeah. to that people can have, they can be rageaholics without being alcoholics. And I've yeah, known two different things. And together, those two are like dynamite. It's it's um, very dangerous. I one good thing that I I found learned from you yesterday is that in your process of writing this, you consulted your uncle James. And yes. um, for those of you that haven't read it yet, um, I I would say his his mom and uncle James are two really big heroes in the book, and it was it made me really happy knowing that uncle james helped you and gave his stamp of approval on the book and he sadly passed away my condolences mm -hmm. to the riggs family for that loss uh, i'm really grateful he was able to read this so and i and i the last uh, i haven't told this to my aunt but the last time i visited with my uncle james um as I said goodbye, he gave me a big hug, and he had never done that before. And at the time, I wondered why was he why was he doing this. And now, in hindsight, I look back and I think he was showing his appreciation for my, in a sense, immortalizing those experiences and and putting them in the book. That gives me chills. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's that's really beautiful because he comes from Uncle James, your grandparents, your parents, my grandparents. Um, all come from a generation in which they didn't communicate feelings. They didn't talk about these dark family secrets. And that was probably a huge admission for him to um, show his expression of love for him. So, mm -hmm. what, uh, so what was your favorite scene to write in the book? Um, there's a number of them probably, and not a little excuse me, not all of them will come up at the moment, but the one that I really liked that generally I would, I think of more often is the one about eating watermelon on the front porch. Um, I don't, I, I don't know that I want to get too much into detail, but as some of the scenes, many of the scenes are, they're composites of similar scenes. So it's not just that we had watermelon on the porch once, but it, it was more of a typical compilation of what would happen when we had watermelon. It would be on the front porch. It would be in the evening. It would be. It would. It would have been something that my uncle and I had picked from the field earlier in the day, left in the refrigerator, brought out, cut with a big butcher knife on newspaper, huge pieces. Um, my brother and I would sit on the edge of the porch and spit seeds and argue about who spit the farthest and. Etc. <laughs> so, and, <laughs> I think you all were the origin of farm to table because literally, almost I would say ninety five percent of what you all ate was you know either killed right in the backyard or it was picked or it was grown and harvested and brought inside and you could feel the love in the kitchen for every scene that you wrote. Well, so if the, I do remember the watermelon seeds and I felt like I was sitting on the porch with you and your brother razzing each other. What mm. was <laughs> because this book does also cover so many painful, painful moments for you. What was the hardest scene for you to write? Um, the hardest might have been, I think, um, was the one where uh, a physical abuse where my father and I was probably in the fourth grade, maybe the third grade, uh, dragged my mother across the living room floor by her hair. So that was the, as I recall, that was the worst physical abuse he had. Uh, most of the time it was slapping and hitting, but I may have not been around for, I'm sure I wasn't around for some of it uh, that could have been worse, but that was the worst thing I recall. Um, but as I said earlier, I had, I think I had processed a lot of the pain that was in that well of, of my pain 
uh, as a therapist over the years. And so as I uh, wrote about that and thought about that, it didn't have the same intensity as it would have otherwise. So it was relatively easy for me to look at the truth and, or, and or write it in a way that was as true as I could recall. I think that it's lovely that you had years to process and do healing work because as writers, if we write too soon after a traumatic event, it's very messy and it's re-traumatizing mm -hmm. in many ways. Mm -hmm. So I, speaking of the, the trauma and that scene, your mother is clearly a, a, a victim of your father's abuse, rage. And although she was a victim, I really felt her coming across as incredibly brave and strong. And I love the way that you wrote about her. In many ways, all of you were victims of a generation in which PTSD, alcoholism, and domestic abuse, they weren't talked about. This was the 50s for much of the book. Mm -hmm. Religious beliefs of your mother's family, social dogma of the time, it really kept women under the thumb of men and trapped often in abusive marriages with very little options and li little legal or financial resources to help them, even if they wanted to leave, even if it was even a consideration in their minds. Um, if your mom had been born 40 or 50 years later, if this had taken place in a different generation, do you think that she would have responded the same way as she did then? I wouldn't be surprised if she wouldn't have. I think at the time she somewhat felt boxed in and dependent, as, as you've mentioned with the expectations and the norms, et cetera, in her marriage and didn't see an option to leave. Um, didn't have a lot of options to work. Uh, she tried working for several companies, um, but I don't know that that lasted very long. Um, I don't know that my father wanted her to work because I think he may have felt threatened that she would become too independent. Mm, I got that sense. Um, so, um, I think she was doing the best she could. I, I believe she I accepted that my father loved her and she loved him. And she was going to fight as hard as she could to try to change his behavior. But as a in a relationship with alcoholism, the codependency to change it is usually futile. So she did the best she could um, until at some point, I think she began to wean herself away in some ways from my father when she, she would take my brother and I to roller skate on Fridays and Saturday nights. But at that time we were already 13. We were in the, I was in probably junior high school and my brother was third or fourth grade at that point, I think sounds about right. Yeah. I, I was really happy to see her shifting the power dynamic later in the years. And I do, I'm not gonna spoil anything for you all, but um, she started making decisions within the confines of how she was trapped to still find a life for herself and a way of, I guess, find a refuge for herself on those nights that your dad would, would come home um, in a, a mad, hot, sweet mess. You've got, I'm admitting someone. So, Throughout your childhood and because of your father's binge drinking and his inability to stay at any one job, your family was often on the verge of homelessness. And there were times even when you had a home without any running water or um, a bathroom, they're one, of, you're one of your, they're your last homes, you had a, um, an outhouse that you had to take the chamber pot out to. Um, you had to move school system to school system, sometimes every couple of months. I can't imagine the impact it had on you. I find it interesting that your grandparents were poor as well, and they were subsistence farmers, but you always get a sense when you're talking about being with your grandparents that you felt rich, incredibly rich with love and food and connection when you were with them. How mm has -hmm. growing up in these rural areas and on the verge of homelessness and, and extreme poverty, how has it shaped you as a person in life? 
Well, I think the, as a result of moving around, although we didn't leave towns, we didn't leave the state, we would move from one street to another in a similar or same neighborhood, nearby neighborhood, and once out, outside of Louisville to a place called Fairdale, which isn't far, but far enough. As a child, I felt like I was getting ripped away from friends in somewhat of a reg on a regular basis. So I, I became much more um, uh, passive in approaching people. But when they approached me, then I accepted the relationship. Um, so I think it, that that affected me in that way. Um, what, can you repeat the, qu yeah, <laughs> the question? I it's, it's how did growing up um, in that poverty shape who you are today? And, and recently you had mentioned to me that it connected you with the outdoors more deeply, which is a, a yeah. passion of yours. Yeah. Well, I learned to be frugal, not to be spent, uh, not to uh, waste money, not to waste things and throw things away needlessly. So I learned to repair things, kind of learning how things work. So if it broke, fix it. <laughs> Um, going to the farm left me experiencing the outdoors, the seasons of, uh, of, the, of the harvesting, of planting, the weather, um, interaction with animals, mostly small animals, but occasionally a cow here and there or a horse or a, a mule, um, left me experiencing the outdoors um, in a, um, uh, not a, long distance way of, of, of travel, but within, within the farm and on the farm. Um, hunting animals like rabbits and squirrel um, and frogs, killing them <laughs> That was food. a crazy scene. <laughs> um, left me with mixed feelings and gave me a perspective that, uh, in the final analysis that I really didn't like killing animals. Mm. It, it, uh, and if you are gonna kill an animal, treat it more like an American Indian would and thank it for giving its life to sustain you in your life. But don't be wasteful about it. Don't take it for granted, that kind of thing. That, um, my, uh, it is true that my, uh, maternal grandparents weren't rich, but they always had plenty of food. There was never complaints about not enough. There was always electricity in the house and firewood to burn and, and so on. Though they didn't have an indoor bathroom. <laughs> um, so there was always sufficient and, and never a worry in that sense. So I always had a feeling that from that standpoint, um, there was plenty. And then from the standpoint of large family gatherings and interacting with cousins and, and so on, that there was always plenty on the social level and the interaction level, that there was plenty of love. There was plenty of people around to interact with, plenty of people to care about or to be cared uh, by. Um, so yeah, I, I learned that as well. Do you have any, do you have a, do you feel like you have a deeper sense of compassion and empathy for kids that are growing up in abusive households or growing up on the verge of homelessness or in? Probably, I think I learned, well, who knows how much of my compassionate nature and my empathy or ability to empathize came from natural born temperament and how much came from being around my mother or my grandmothers. Um, I think I, I learned early on to be very observant. That's what happens when you're in a traumatic situation. Yes. And so I became very attuned to being able to, to, to how would I say, attuned to what other people might be feeling. Mm -hmm. In a sense, being able to put myself in their shoes and imagine what they might be experiencing. Um, so uh, I think that, um, uh, growing up and, and having to be put in that situation to exercise those psychic muscles, those emotional muscles, 
uh, primed me, I think, uh, to be able to be empathetic. And that, that in a sense, primed me to be, <laughs> become, or to have the ability or the willingness to become a therapist, which further deepened it over it is, time as well. It is interesting how I'm an empath as well. And there are a lot of direct parallels and connections between people that have had trauma um, early in life and having empathy and having intuitive abilities. Um, mm. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but for those of us that have had that early trauma, we tend to be very empathic. So there are some, we have a, I have a couple more questions for you, and then we're going to open it up to a Q and A. There are some darker moments in the book. Um, one of which, one of which was especially disturbing to me. Um, and I know each of you, as you read it, some things may not bother you and then other things might. And I think a lot of that has to do with our own personal life experiences. I was wondering, as I was reading this one particular chapter, did you debate whether to share this chapter or not? And I told you what that chapter was. Mm -hmm. And were you worried with some of these stories that you would be judged? Or did you feel it was more important to include and show how you had your own repressed rage and anger from being a boy with a father who's a rageaholic? Mm -hmm. um, I did have some concerns about the particular chapter you're referring to or the scenes you're referring to. I think I had um, concluded or determined early on that if I was going to write something worthwhile, it needed to be honest. And I shouldn't leave out that particular one, but in general, I shouldn't leave out anything that I was concerned or uncomfortable about simply because I was concerned or uncomfortable with it. That to have a good memoir, it needed to be the full spectrum. Uh, anger from a victim of abuse is a result of the abuse and it's I think inevitable likely probably and without that scene it, it might not lend so much credibility to the full story as well um, I had somewhat tested that out in previous critique groups um, and um, as well I, I as a therapist uh, I had worked with drug uh, in drug and alcohol recovery, working with people. Um, and part of the recovery programs I was in encouraged people to attend 12 step meetings as part of their recovery. The 12 steps themselves, I think are a good guide to um, uh, personal development, whether you have an alcohol or drug problem or any other kind of problem at all, particularly the fourth step which is taking a, as they call it, quote, fearless moral inventory, end quote. Wow, I like that. And then that. a fifth step to share it with one other person, with, with your higher power, and then with another person. And that becomes part of the healing process, and which I think is absolutely necessary. Of course, when you're in therapy, you're sharing it with another human, another person. So I think it's parallel to the therapeutic process as well. Um, so I, I didn't want to shy away from writing that, um, simply because I was uncomfortable with it. And yes, people may judge me, but I think the worst judge of all is myself. Yes. And now that I've accepted, that's what I did and reconciled and attempted in my own fashion to make amends. Uh, that's all I can expect. And if other people uh, I, I think there's more help in other people reading that and seeing that mm -hmm. than whatever harm in a sense might come to me because other people may judge it mm -hmm. harshly. I, it's like we're all capable of this kind of behavior. And <laughs> uh, the only way to deal with it is be truthful and go right through it. That is such a great metaphor for life. And I think that it's so courageous because it's, it's easy to reveal other people's demons, but it's an incredible act of courage to reveal your own demons and understand that you may be, may, may be judged. And mm -hmm. I, 
I understand why you included that chapter in that story. And mm -hmm. I think it's interesting too, that you could take 20 of us in this group, we all read it and we're all going to be disturbed by different things, not the same things. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's also interesting that a, um, that even though you're not a recovering alcoholic, that the AA steps have helped you heal from trauma. And mm -hmm. I, I hadn't realized that it could be a tool for healing from trauma as well and preparing you emotionally to write this memoir. So yeah. that said, do you believe it's true that the truth will set you free? Do you feel a sense of peace now that your book is out in the world? Yes, I think so. Uh, as the f saying goes, you're only as sick as your secrets. Ooh. And so I, I think... Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I think, um, as I said, recovery from an addictive process, um, healing in a therapeutic process are very much parallel. They both require being honest, at least with one other human being, mm. um, uh, letting go of the secrets. Uh, so I do think that's uh, necessary uh, to occur for all of us to to give away our secrets and and to live then without them they're such a burden i just felt something release in my chest i think about all of the secrets i've held on to and that mm -hmm. that that was what oprah would say is an aha moment is that you're only as sick as your secrets that that secrets really do burden us they physically impact us we hold them in the cells of our bodies and they can weigh us down Sometimes we know it and sometimes we don't, but nevertheless, yes, they, they weigh us down and hold us back. Well, what do you hope will be the takeaway for readers, everyone on the call included and in the world that are going to be reading this book? What, <laughs> what is your great hope? I, well, I probably have several. I don't know if I can say one. I hope they're entertained by it. I hope they're inspired by it. I hope that they use it as a survival guide, at least in the sense that they can let go maybe of some of their secrets, that they can see there's hope that um, unconditional love is a, a powerful, uh, positive force mm. within the human community. Um, that, uh, I don't know, beyond that. <laughs> Do you feel like this is a part of your legacy as well? You've immortalized your family. Well, I certainly hope it's a legacy. <laughs> it is part of it, but I don't know how long of a legacy. I just hope it's a permanent. Well, I'm just one person, and I was excited to meet <laughs> some of the Riggs family on here and some of your family. And I I feel like you've, you've done a beautiful job of immortalizing the love in your family, not just the darkness, but the love. So could you, I was thinking um, as we wrap up the questions, before I ask you what your next project is, there was a passage, Connor, that I really feel mm. encapsulates the book so beautifully. Uh -huh. It's very mm -hmm. short. It's the bottom of 288 to 289, starting with I Cherish. Yeah, it's the closing of the book. <laughs> I cherish most of my childhood memories, particularly those of the farm and not just grandma's smiles and gentle manner. I cherish those of play with cousin Billy, my soulmate, and piles of broken Easter egg shells scattered across the front yard. I cherish those of warm tomatoes off the vine, cornbread soaked in a glass of cold fresh milk and watermelon consumed on the front porch. As I continue to mull my painful memories over time, my mental tapestry shifts the worst memories lose their power and fade like grime cleansed by detergent. Those memories that remain are the better ones, the best ones, the important ones to caress. Memory is that way, strange and wonderful. Bravo, such a beautiful, yeah, we're getting some thumbs up from Canada. <laughs> So what is, before we go into the Q&A, could you share with everyone what your next project is? Um, well, it, um, the most immediate is I'm thinking about going, revi reverting back to my previous memoir that I had written or mentioned that I'd written and, and finalizing that and getting it published. And depending on how long it takes to revise that, 
I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm ready to get it published. <laughs> so you have three three planned. This is the first of three, correct? What's well, that, that? Yeah, this is the first. The Vietnam is the second, and I have a climbing uh, climbing experiences I've compiled, and I'm I'm thinking I might be able to fashion that into a memoir if I can. Who knows? I may be the first person to write a memoir trilogy. I, I love this idea. And again, that my first thought when I finished is telling my husband went into the house immediately. And I said, I cannot wait to experience Vietnam through Conard's eyes and see what you have to share because it's so thoughtful. Um, so we're going to transition into the Q&A. And I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Conard brought up that this Thursday, April 7th is National Alcohol Screening Day. And so I'm going to put into the sidebar into the chat a link if you know anyone that could be helped from this as a resource. And this isn't just for anyone that you think is an alcoholic or an addict. It's also for loved ones of alcoholics as well and loved ones of rageaholics. I know that there's um, also an organization, Adult Children of Alcoholics, and it's good for any adult children of any dysfunctional families. It's not just alcoholism. So I'm going to put that into the sidebar. Um, I'm also going to put into the sidebar the link to purchase your copy of his book. And it is such a wonderful help to any author if you like his book, which we hope that you love it as much as I have, please take a moment when you finish it to write a positive review on Amazon because it really helps how he shows up in the Amazon rankings. And what else were we going? Oh, I wanted to also mention that please keep Conard in mind for if you know of any local groups, it, it can be in Kentucky, it can be in Canada, they can be farm living groups, it can be trauma healing groups, any groups or book clubs that you think that this book would be applicable to, Conard's open and ready to be booked for public speaking on podcasts, radio shows, and events, both virtually and in person. And do you have anything to, oh, and my other thing was make sure to, and we're gonna do the Q&A next, to go to his website, conardhogan.com. I'll put that in the sidebar as well in the chat. And if you're not signed up yet for his newsletter, it's a great way of keeping up with his blog posts. He only sends out four newsletters a year and they're really entertaining. And he has a great mix of articles, everything, stories from hiking and traveling in Iceland and Antarctica to traveling to PCT to his work with the 12 steps program. So I highly recommend signing up for his newsletter. So thank you so much for waiting oh you go ahead yeah and and i have a book to give away yes and we have a book giveaway too why don't we do the q a and then we will do the the book giveaway so okay. i'm just going to open this up to anyone who has a question and if you want to raise your hand or tell me in the chat you have a question i'm, I'm going to unmute you so you can just talk out loud i think john earlier on if john's still on i saw something come up in the chat I think he had asked. Yeah, uh, hi, Connor. Hey, um, when one of the earlier things you said was that you had written a, uh, a memoir about Vietnam experiences, but you hadn't uh, taken it to publication, I think is what you said. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering what you did do with it. Did you share it in any way? Did you? you know, wrap it in cellophane and put it on the shelf. <laughs> what did you do and how did how did that make you feel about it? Did you feel, um, you know, incomplete in any way about doing that? Well, uh, I'm not going to name names. However, I was told to put it on the shelf. And I, I don't know if I misinterpreted that or not. It was suggested to me that perhaps I did misinterpret that, that it, I, I might have been being told to get it published and put it on the shelf or I might have been put it on the shelf and let it collect dust but I interpreted it the second way and I thought well okay so be it I'll leave it for a while and I'll come back later and then I focused on writing this memoir um so um 
<laughs> I was quite disappointed, but again, that's my own interpretation, which I think was probably incorrect. Um, nevertheless, I, I think it tells me I wasn't ready to have it published at that point. So do you think it was a matter of quality or of, um, uh, content? Um, I don't know if it was either one of those. Oh, it's not a blood and guts. It's a everyday, um, for every single one infantryman that was sent to Vietnam, there was 22 support personnel sent to Vietnam. And they did things like cook, um, take cargo off the ships, uh, polish the general's shoes <laughs> and make his coffee. Um, so th there was a lot of, uh, of uh, military personnel who experienced uh, the warfare in a different way than what you would see in Apocalypse Now or Platoon. And I wanted to portray that because I think that's more of the norm. Uh, we normally see the dramatic, the thrilling, the gory, the violent, uh, but that's not that's not the, the story for most of the predominant number of uh, military servicemen who were in Nam. Um... So anyway, that that's kind of what my focus is, is on. Thank you. I will uh, add to that that I've been exposed to some of Conard's Vietnam work. And I also, first of all, Conrad, you'll see I wrote you a chat. I apologize for not yet responding to your email about it, which I will. Okay, but having said that, I mean, that jogged my memory. But having said that, I will say that, yes, uh, he may, what I have seen so far is about sort of those kinds of elements, but it also has these wonderful, and I'm gonna call it again, a coming of age. It has these wonderful coming of age aspects to it as Conard as this young man is discovering things about himself through being in Vietnam it's not so much I don't know if that makes sense to you Conard oh yeah but it, yeah it's not so much about being in warfare it's about being in Vietnam among these fellow soldiers and and the overall experience and how he grows up through that experience. So, um, so again, once we start talking about it more, Conrad, I think that's kind of the focus of, of what the book is, and that's probably mm -hmm. going to be your core. So that was it. Thank you, me. Dale. Thank you. And again, Dale, <laughs> you did a fabulous job edit as the editor on this book. Um, he did a shout out to both of us and the acknowledgments, which was such an honor. And I appreciate that you brought Conrad into my life. <laughs> yeah, with just a direct line there. Yeah. <laughs> so, are there any other questions? I see. Uh, looks yeah. like Bill. Bill has his hand raised or raised. Okay, let me. Yes, I had. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, all that you have with us, and we certainly heard some sorrows. I was wondering, when you were writing the book, what gave you kind of the the best feeling when you were writing it? What did you really? What What gave you joy? as you were writing that scene or, or that experience? Um, well, there were a number of scenes like the watermelon scene I really felt good about, um, uh, climbing in a fruit tree, uh, picking tomatoes, eat, you know, eating um, uh, cornbread with, in a glass of cold fresh milk. So there was a lot of those little experiences that I recalled. But I think the, the bigger theme for me was I'm writing, I'm writing about my appreciation, <clears throat> my um, <clears throat> wanting to honor uh, the people that had been in my life that showed me support and love. Now, I didn't, I'm not saying I didn't get it some from everyone, even my dad, he showed love too. Um, but I, I, somehow that theme was underlying everything I was writing was I'm, I'm kind of doing this out of my love uh, for being given the love I did get and becoming which led to me becoming the person I am now. I, hopefully that answers the questions but there, yeah. there should be a number of scenes in there where I would hope people would think boy that that was really great and that I you know 
that I really enjoyed uh, that I look back with fondness on. Thank you, Bill. Did you have a follow-up question to that? No, no, I didn't. Thank you so much. Um, we have another hand up and it is coming from someone that knows you quite well. <laughs> Your wife. <laughs> Actually, I was um, going to give you kind of a follow-up to what is in the book. Um, I knew Conrad's dad for maybe the last 20 years of his life, something like that. And during that time, I never saw him touch a drop of alcohol. So he did um, stop drinking at some point. I am so glad you shared that, Janet, because it's never come up in conversation with Connor. The book closes, or, yeah, it does. It, it kind of ends at 18 and then there's a little bit of um, follow up on Connor with his parents, but I'm really happy to hear that. Thank you for sharing I, that. I don't, if I can interject, I don't think I'm giving anything away by saying in hindsight, uh, I think my dad, as a lot of people abusing um, a substance or a process, he was in this case with alcohol as a, consuming alcohol, he was self-medicating his post-traumatic stress from World War II, which actually was kindled his rageaholism too. So I think it was a matter of undiagnosed, unrecognized, untreated post-traumatic stress. And how many families ha are going through that, the generational trauma, and it goes back to his father and the father before that. And mm -hmm. that generation, again, that they're in, they didn't have words for PTSD. They didn't talk about therapy. And we still have this toxic masculinity in the military today. Um, but at mm -hmm. least we can talk about these things. Thank you, Janet, for adding that. I really appreciate having you here as well. Um, do you have any other, I think my mom has a, her hand up as well. Janet, did you want to add anything else? Well, um, I have to say, even though his dad didn't drink, he didn't always treat his wife, kind of his mom, the best. And used a lot of put downs on her. And she was a really sweet, very, very sweet lady. Uh, yeah, and I think her self-confidence was definitely impacted by the way his dad treated his mom. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, those behaviors, they, they don't go away. They might mellow out with age, but the abuse is still there in other forms. Thank you, Janet. Um, so I'm going to... Um, bring my mom up front for a question. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Connor, because of what I've read in the book, I'm halfway through, mm -hmm. but more so because of what I've heard you speak about today in this gathering. With Rachel's help, I'm going to find, we've talked about this a lot, with my family situation of trauma from my father, not a drinker, but terrible anger. I'm going to find the group that is best for me to start working through some healing on myself. Now, Rachel and I have talked about that, but I'm publicly saying I'm going to do it. Mm. Thank you, Connor, That's for sharing because you've you've made that possible in my life that's a good next step for you to take and i'm glad to hear that that was part of my motivation and the reason i like that quote that i've read from Brene brown yeah you're getting some thumbs up and hearts mom i think that's beautiful and i know that some of the material is is um can be hard to to read when you come from abuse um, I, I, this is like, it's a beautiful thing to come out of just even not having read the book, but attending this and listening to Connor. Thank you for sharing. Would anyone else like to ask any questions? 
I'm streaming through to see if there's any, anyone, don't see any, don't any see of his any. family. Um, I love that. Going had, once, going twice. <laughs> <laughs> I love that there's a friend on here or was that you had met in Mongolia. So, um, well, thank you for sharing <clears throat> with us today and just honoring Connard's journey as a writer and being here for the celebration. And I uh, will do the gift drawing as well. Um, I hope that all of you order at least one book and spread the word on this beautiful book. I love the cover design. It's just a gorgeous book. He went through a lot of iterations on the cover and I think it's a very hopeful looking book. And Janet is the uh, professional photographer that took his headshot <laughs> <laughs> on the back. <laughs> I gave a little guidance on the headshot and she did a great job. So, <laughs> And Janet, thank you for, you know, the partners of writers are the ones that are in the trenches, really, because um, you're married to a very hardworking, obsessive writer, and you've had to support him for years in his passions. So thank you. Hats off to you for that. So do you want to do the drawing, Connor? Sure. And Karen Stroh said, thank you so much. And Sheila said, thank you so much. Great. Please make sure to write okay. a review. Hopefully you love it. And if you love it, write a review. Give them a, a, a five-star review. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks, Dale. Thanks. Being honest, Thanks. I don't know which name I'm pulling out. I haven't looked. Betty Huff. Betty Huff isn't here, is she? I, no, I think Betty's. Let me scroll through. So you snooze, you lose. You don't get the book unless you're here. I didn't see Betty on today. I don't see her either. You she all have good, good odds right now. Yeah, that's one down. Down to 11 people. I'm not going to pick my name and or Rachel's name. Okay, or here's the second one. <laughs> John. Oh. oh, boy. Yay. And, and, I, and I was just about to hit send. <laughs> <laughs> well, Whoops. you can still buy a book. You can still buy a copy and give it to someone. Um, John and my mom and Connard are in a read and critique book um, group together. So they've become mm -hmm. friends online virtually. Very, congratulations, John. <laughs> and um, you guys have each other's uh, info. So Connard can reach out to you and, and um, get your address to send you the yeah. book. We'll work out okay. details, John. Any last questions before we, we let you all go? <clears throat> No. Well, I want to thank everybody again for coming. I appreciate it. It's an honor to have all of you join me, be willing to listen to me, and to be willing to read my book. I hope. <laughs> I'm so. You can see I'm just full of self-deprecation. <laughs> That's well, part of my humor. <laughs> Connor, I'm so proud of you. I'm inspired <laughs> by this guy is such a hard worker. I give a lot of homework as um, a coach and consultant. And this guy sets such a high bar. He is so driven. Oh my gosh. And so bright and hardworking. And you have a long-term vision in your life and it's really inspiring. And the fact that you just hiked part of the PCT last week. <laughs> You're I'm a still sore from it too. <laughs> And he is a wonderful and interesting man. That's what Lily just said. So thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, we hope you all have a beautiful spring. And um, Karen said, you'll be great in every interview you do. You're incredibly articulate and inspiring. Thank you again. I'll make sure to save the chat so we get to see yeah. all of the, the chat. I have done podcasts. You can listen to those. Go to my website. Yeah, definitely go There'll to be more of those. Go to his website, sign up for his email, um, and please stay in touch with, with both of us and let you know what you're all up to creatively. Um, and for those of you that live here locally, um, <clears throat> Connor will be doing some book signings here as well. So, And you have a media page now that gives uh, links to all of the podcasts and interviews you've done. Yeah. I'd yeah. love to see you on a podcast in Kentucky, you know, for rural country living or, or something around trauma. I think I'd really love to just have you get the word out. So looking right. forward to it. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. <laughs> Bye for now.